Uh, hello everyone, I hope you can hear me. And I think you can hear me, yes, there we go. So, welcome everyone to the second lecture. Um, the first lecture went great, if, uh, if I do say so myself. I have a little bit of housekeeping to do for this lecture. Uh, nothing negative or anything like that, just some housekeeping. And the housekeeping is that this lecture was pre-recorded. Uh, it was pre-recorded because our main couldn't really make the timestamp and that's fine. So we pre-recorded, our main still going to speak. That does, however, mean that the questions will be forwarded over to somewhere else. Uh, in this case, Matrix. So for the continued discussion after or even during the live stream, please go over to Matrix, hop in the channel and ask your questions there. Um, we will try for the questions that come in on YouTube, LinkedIn, and the OwnCast instance, and even Twitter, uh, to also put them in the Matrix channel. But if you have some questions that you want our main to answer, then please post them in the Matrix channel. Uh, I also want to take, again, just like last time, a small amount of time to thank the people that made the Summer of Nix happen, especially Analnet, the European Commission, the Nixos Foundation, and Tweak. So, without further ado, I will start our main lecture about the history of Nixres, and I will let himself explain what it's about. So, okay, good afternoon. My name is Armin. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of NixOS. So, I, I want to say that one thing is that maybe this is not the real history of NixOS, but at least it's how I remember it from, gosh, uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, if you haven't seen Ilko's talk from last week yet, I encourage you to do that first because he will explain it. He will have explained a few things that I might be referencing. So a little bit about me first. I started computer science at Utah University, uh, where I met Ilko and a few other people, where I worked on NixOS as my uh, master thesis project. After I, that, I drifted away to do other things, mostly related to things like system administration. I actually was a board member of the Dutch Unix users group for four years. And then I pivoted to mostly legal and licensing. So, for example, I was on the core team of GPLviolations.org, a organization going after companies that didn't adhere to the GPL license terms. And uh, currently, since 2011, I have my own consultancy focusing on things like open source license compliance, software provenance, and so on. So I help companies, mostly in industrial automation and automotive, to actually become a license compliant to make sure that they have correct processes. I've done quite a bit of work fighting copyright trolls in court as well, uh, mostly in Germany, and I help companies to come into compliance and to make sure that they, uh, whenever they encounter someone doing enforcement or they encounter a troll, that at least that is, at, at least on the technical part, it's all covered. I, think I do things like audits, I, and I also, uh, sometimes double a little bit in open source and patents and where they intersect. So quite a bit different, but there's one thing that um, is something that I carried over from NixOS and that is software provenance, which I will reference later on a few times as well. So keep that in mind, software provenance. So my journey with open source started sometime in 1994. So first there was a free BSD, then Linux, and then before uh, that, so I, I started using FreeBSD and Linux before uh, switching over completely, and that was in even before Windows 95 was released. In 1996, I started uh, studying at Utrecht University, where I met Elko for the first time, so I've known him for 26 years already. Time flies. So at, at university, then I added uh, HP, UX, and IRIX to the list of OSs that I'd used, and then Solaris a year later. So back then, it was still very much a Unix stronghold. It changed a little bit later. So it was uh, all these things, Unix, no Windows at that time. So while I was there, I was some other friends at the physics department who were very deep into Debian. So, and I was discussing things with them, like, okay, so, you know, how should I do X, Y, Z? 
And their answer would always be, oh, you just run app get install, or they would just scream at me app get install. And that really <laughs> pissed me off quite a bit because it was not a useful answer for me. It irritated me and then it turned me away from Debian uh, very, very early on. It's like, okay, well, if this is the attitude of Debian, then I'm not interested in Debian. So through a friend a few years later, I got involved in a uh, fairly unknown Linux distribution called Rock Linux. So that is no longer uh, existent. It's it's basically has been dead for well over 15 years, not seeing any development at all. Um, because they peaked, I think, in 2000, 2001 or so. Uh, I mostly got involved in working a little bit on the Ultra Spark port. And this distribution was very much a built from source distribution very much influenced by FreeBSD ports, but then not like FreeBSD ports. And uh, it, it basically had the same, quite a bit of the same attitude as Gen 2. So you do build from source, you have recipes, all that. And then at least uh, after that, when you're doing a build, you see lots of stuff just scrolling on your screen. And then at the uh, after that, you actually have a package. So the the project was interesting but it wasn't very successful and i think that most of the developers just switched to gen 2 after a while because as soon as gen 2 uh, picked up steam, up steam it just turned out to be a better solution so they just all went to uh, you know, went to uh, gen 2 except for me i ended up installing red hat linux and then later fedora core and actually i've been on fedora ever since so uh, sh don't tell the other nixos people Around 2002, I took over the management of a student lab at the university. Uh, actually, it was uh, mismanaged then. Uh, it's actually a funny story. The, the lab itself had been funded by Microsoft and through a assistant professor. And the people who were uh, working there, they basically, they, they were doing, everything was in Windows. They were all doing uh, this, a uh, lot of .NET stuff. Uh, so, the assistant professor is actually Eric Meyer, the famous head in the box for, I think, for Visual Basic TV, or I don't know. But if you just search for head in the box, then you will probably find him. Um, so they were, they, were, they were doing a lot of stuff with, uh, I think, Haskell for uh, Haskell.NET bindings. There were these Microsoft Activate, so I still know all of the Barney songs that were in that doll. Horrible. Um, a lot of stuff like that. But uh, after a few years, it basically turned into a, I don't want to say pirate thing, but uh, there were plenty of torrents there and it was explicitly outside of the university firewall because they they wanted to, uh, they wanted that, but it just was just uh, full of crap. So I basically got punched into there, had to uh, take it over and then I started to convert it into a Linux lab. Um, so I got very interested in portability because of the other OSs that I, I'd used, like FreeBSD and the other architectures like that I used, like MIPS and UltraSpark. And then uh, one day, a big pile of old PCs became available. So we decided to just, you know, build a build farm, play around a little bit with build farm software, see if we can do uh, CICD, do continuous builds of... Uh, of various programs that the department were, was building. So our test case was the Stratego, Stratego XT program transformation tool. Uh, but, and so we actually had quite a few different build farms because we also wanted to verify like what is a good piece of build farm software. So we had uh, a few things running on Mozilla Tinderbox. Uh, we had the Samba build farm. We also had some the build farm software created at the university in Amsterdam and so on. That was a quite, interesting experience so we back then pcs were a little bit bigger and um, they were not very powerful so we had a lot a whole pile and basically it was two tables full of computers and a very big switch and lots of cables and we actually had quite a few things installed on it like free bsd net bsd uh, open bsd uh, various flavors of linux and so on so 
what we found is that the build farm software was suboptimal at best. Uh, so builds would sometimes fail after up, uh, updating the underlying system, and it would be very hard to reproduce the, and, and debug. So basically, it was a don't touch or it will break. Uh, so one example is that we had one machine in the Samba build farm that we had was running OpenBSD. And I had updated the base system, and then all of a sudden, the build started failing. So I looked into it with the Samba developer, and he said, well, we haven't actually changed the software that, that is failing. So it turned out that there was a bug, and we caught it. But it was very hard to see from just from the build farm logs because it was in the underlying system. And while the build farm itself was fixed, like it would build a certain revision, it didn't make any assumptions about the underlying system. So you could basically swap out the entire system underneath, put in something else. The build farm software would still think like, oh, this is open BSD or something. And uh, it wouldn't actually correctly I'll just say that represent the state of the uh, of the underlying hardware. It wouldn't uh, actually describe the state of the underlying operating system. So there could be bugs that you could see and and and, and find, and you wouldn't know where to start because if you would start looking in your own program and the bug wasn't there, it was almost impossible to find without having access to the machine. And of course, we didn't give them external access to our machine because it was on the university network. So that was a very useful learning experience where you found that you don't have to just uh, describe and look at your own program, but at the entire operating system, because that has an influence on how you're building and what you're building and, and if something fails or not. So I presented a paper about that at the UK UEG Linux conference in 2003. Uh, there was a... Uh, I'm not sure if people actually understood back then what I was talking about or the impact, but um, it was still a very useful learning experience for us. So by that time, Ilko had started working on Nix uh, around this point so in 2003. And one of the first cases was doing release management for Stratego XT. So this is Ilko giving a talk at the Stratego user days in 2004. It's a little bit blurry but it really says release management for stratego with nix so that was basically the major use case back then so um, as ilko said in his talk there actually was a project before nix called mac it never saw an official release but at least there was a wikipedia page for some reason one of the department members had made a wikipedia page about uh, this tool that never even was released to the public. So a little known fact is that uh, Bram Molinar of Vim Thane actually was working on something along the lines of Nix, but then different, something called App, which was funded by NLNet Foundation. And Ilko and Bram actually spent an afternoon discussing their respective systems. Uh, I don't think that whatever Bram said influenced Nix in any way, but at least it was fun. This the little historical side bit that uh, so so a, a little historical fact that two people who are very well known in their respective communities met to talk about something like this. At least I find that funny. So NixOS started in two thousand four. I was searching for a new project because the previous one that I worked on actually didn't get off the ground. And then it was suggested by our supervisor, like, oh, you know, why don't you try to build a complete Linux distribution with Nix? And I thought, like, yeah, <laughs> why not? So some work had been done already. So there was a thing called Nix U, which was a minimal user mode Linux distro built with Nix. So it didn't contain the kernel. There wasn't was basically just a few packages and a few things that you can run in a some sort of virtual machine. So my goal was to go all the way and to have something that I could actually install onto real hardware like a CD, because that's what we did back then with the install CDs. And we didn't know if it would be possible. So can we actually scale Nix to a complete Linux distribution? Of course, we know the answer right now, and that's yes, it works very well, but we didn't know back then. So 
in 2004, I took this NixU and expanded on it. And you can still see this in the in the Git uh, log. If you just go away to the uh, to the earliest commits and search for my name, you will actually see some of the uh, of the commits that I did back then. And because I am stubborn, I used Fedora Core as a base, while Ilko used uh, SUSE. And the thing is that even though they were all uh, doing Linux standard base and they, they were implementing the Linux standards base, they were so different that the stuff that he would build on SUSE didn't work on my Fedora. So uh, this is why the whole standard environment with statically compiled tools was introduced. And that was like, okay, well, there are significant differences between the Linux distributions, so we cannot have reproducible builds if we're building on a uh, on two different distributions that are supposed to be compatible because of the Linux standards base. So uh, my main contribution to this was just moaning a lot uh, to Ilko so he would fix things, which is actually a very good strategy, at least back then it was a very good strategy, just to make sure that, that, that you complain long enough to make Ilko understand things, and then he would fix them eventually. So uh, he did most of that work. Later on, I added quite a few of the tools, of the, uh, the basic tools that you need to get a Linux distribution started. So uh, some of the notes that uh, I'm still not sure if we can actually read them, but this is something that Ilko made back then on his whiteboard, uh, which is uh, completely unreadable, but it says something about how the Nix store worked and with all the hashes and so on. So after adding enough of the essential Linux tools to NixOS, we actually installed it in a fairly rudimentary way. So there was a, uh, a, a shell script that would just basically just copy packages from the CD uh, to disk, and then we could boot it in a very, very rudimentary way. And we got a few packages to run and so on. And we, we played around a little bit and that worked fine. And then a few days later, we actually found out that I had forgotten to create the bin sh symlink. And at that point, we knew that this would work and uh, it gave a major morale boost to the project, or at least it gave me a major morale boost. Like, okay, well, this will really work. And it also made Ilko very happy, as you can see here. He was uh, absolutely thrilled. Like, okay, well, you know, we can make this work and, and we're actually more compat or more portable than the Linux standards base because we built it on one machine and there it ran in Nix and we installed it onto another machine and there it runs as well. So that was a, um, a major boost. So what we did is we installed a new build farm. We got a little bit of budget. We installed a new build, build farm with uh, two main machines called Itchy and Scratchy. So from back when the Simpsons were uh, still interesting to watch. Uh, so initially installed with uh, SUSE Linux and eventually Ilko just completely switched them to NixOS after more programs were added to Nix packages. And those machines kept running for quite a long time and doing a lot of the, a lot of the build work. So the two black Dell machines on top, those are itchy and scratchy. So they, they were happily building Nix packages then and releasing them as well. So uh, some of more work that I did on NixOS were uh, installation CDs. I um, should still go through my pile of old CDs if I actually can find one, which still has NixOS. I don't think so, but who knows, maybe. And also a few first attempts at cross compilation uh, because I had some other machines with, I think with MIPS or, uh, spark still and i just wanted to have some packages that were cross compiled and that, that i could then install on the other architectures what i found out is that bootstrapping gcc was then impossibly hard and there were a few things with uh with paths and magic and it was just mind-boggling so the first stage gcc that wasn't that wasn't difficult at all but then if you wanted to do anything else like to C++, it was just impossible. I believe that has been fixed now, and now you actually can do a proper cross-compilation, but back then, nope. 
So after that, I moved away from NixOS. Uh, I kept contributing to a few packages for a while. I've, in the last few years, I've added a few more packages and uh, been active in the bug tracker a little bit more as well. But very little of my work has uh, survived. I did a git blame on a few packages that I uh, contributed to. And I think that a few of the brackets at the start and the end, uh, those are still my contributions, according to git blame. So, when NixOS was released, it was a bit of a curiosity. I, I do remember that, that at one point a NixOS version was released and it was done on April the 1st. And I think that people saw it actually as an April Fool's joke because it was uh, like the purely functional Linux distribution. People were like, is this a joke? <laughs> I mean, why would you want to do that? And uh, of course it wasn't a joke. And what I've seen is that the world has changed quite a bit since then and more people have seen the light. So now you see things like reproducible builds getting a lot more attention. Uh, other distributions are, are moving to things like snaps or flat packs where they put all of the necessary dependencies into um, basically one, uh, one package. Of course, you have Docker containers and so on. And what I'm also seeing is that there is a lot more emphasis on provenance. So it, it, this is becoming quite important in things like cybersecurity, license compliance. And of course, with Nix, you have it a lot easier when you want to find out the exact provenance of a package because you can say, well, you know, this is the build script that I made it with, with all of the uh, compilation options, with all of the patches, with all of the, uh, well, everything. So, and and then going back like, okay, and this is how I built the dependencies and the dependencies of the dependencies and so on. And that makes provenance research a lot, lot easier. So I think that um, we were right. Uh, now we just have to convince people to switch to NixOS and that's going to be a bit of a, of a challenge. So then uh, looking forward, where can we go from here? So NixOS is very powerful, but there are a few areas where I think Nix and NixOS could flourish really well because provenance tracking is a lot easier with Nix and NixOS. So what I personally would love to see is NixOS as a viable replacement for something like Yocto Project or OpenWRT so I can build embedded systems or firmware for embedded systems with Nix or NixOS. I think that NixOS and SCADA systems, so you know the, the industrial things that you're uh, like factories, bridges, power plants, uh, you name it, that uh, that having something like NixOS is uh, would be perfect because then you can see something like okay, well you know I really need to know what goes into my nuclear power plant. Other critical infrastructure, core routers, telco systems, and so on is something that I think NixOS would be a perfect match for. Uh, things like real-time operating systems, Zephyr, is uh, getting quite a bit of traction. I want to be able to build programs for Zephyr and firmware for Zephyr with Nix and NixOS. And I think that although this would be a bit of a stretch, but if you could build an entire Android distribution, not just the packages, but the entire Android distribution, including the base packages, without having to, to rely on Google's pre-built tools, that would be very, very helpful. So I'm very hopeful about the future of Nix and NixOS, and I hope to be um, to be a part of that. I was part of the, of the past, I hope to be a part of the future, and I hope that you will be as well. So we can have questions, hopefully. Any questions? I'll just throw myself and Matthias back in here and hopefully Matthias unmutes himself. No, you should be able to hear me. Yes. Um, well, I did have one question that I noted down during your talk is um, you talked a little bit about how NixOS can or Nix or you know Nix and Nix was by extension can help with the licensing story of uh, software. Um, how do you see this? Is like automatic scanning then, or? Well, no. It, the 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 core part, and this is uh, 
is that this is also for for security as long as you know exactly what is going into your your build and mm -hmm. then you can basically look at any meta information like security information or license in licensing information and basically uh, decorate your build process with that like okay we well, you know we have a we're having a build we know exactly what's going in there now look let's do a license scan and then we know which software with which licenses is actually going into the build process and that makes it easier for license compliance yes exactly that makes perfect sense actually and that that's that's uh, and instead of license compliance information you could have security information it's the same thing same process but different data okay um now you you already talked about you were there when it all started right uh, when nix was was still in its early days when nix was still in its early days um and it's grown quite a bit since then um where do you see it heading you talked a little bit about like the, the technical aspect of what nix could do with like um, building an entire android system um from nix um but more focused on the community side of things do you think the community can also still grow exponentially so to speak I actually wouldn't know. I'm, I'm still amazed at, at seeing just what has happened since I last worked on it, mm -hmm. uh, because then it was basically just uh, five people <laughs> or six. So it's, uh, and now it's, I, I don't know how, how many contributors there are, thousand, two thousand? I have, I really have no idea. A few thousand? I don't know. So uh, no, I don't know where it will go. I'm, I, I'm, pretty confident that there um, that a different kind of people will be coming into the community who are more probably more process oriented mm -hmm. instead of the uh, instead of coming so uh, what I notice is that quite a few people are coming from a certain background like functional programming but I, I think that at some point uh, other people will be coming in or saying, well, you know, I did this the whole provenance story is a basically the killer feature for me, for my work. And they will start to move towards NixOS because it just yeah. makes it easier. So I'd say that that will be a different, different vibe at some point, different kind of people. Yeah. But, you know, it's a, I, I don't know how that would be impacting the community, if it would impact the community at all. Speaking sure. about this, um, I, <clears throat> I have a follow up question. Um, when, when you work on, um, as I understood, for figuring out what goes into uh, the firmware of some uh, device, maybe, or something like this, uh, to, to discover uh, any licensing issues or security issues, for example, are you a, a lonely person using Nix for these kind of things? Or is there already a bigger community building up who think that this is a useful tool? I'm actually not using Nix for that. I'm uh, usually telling my clients, like, you could look into Nix to actually prevent this stuff from happening in the future. But usually when, I, when I'm, um, it depends a little bit on the situation. So if I'm called uh, in a troll case, then it's usually very high pressure. Like, okay, we need to know what's in our device uh, right now and how exposed we are. And for that, I'm using uh, firmware analysis tools like Bang. So the, the binary analysis next generation, that's the stuff that I use for that. Uh, after I find, found out what actually is inside, which usually doesn't take that long, then it's just the uh, endless process of working with the company to actually fix it. <laughs> and that happens inside their current build system because they're, they usually, uh, you, you cannot, if you have a deadline to respond within two, three weeks, they cannot just completely rebuild an entire product. So that, that's usually just like, okay, well, there's something right now that's very stressful. We have to fix it right now. And so then there's not a lot of time to talk about Nix or use Nix for that. Right. So I guess there's a, this whole question of how a whole infrastructure can be moved to another system like Nix, for example. Or whether, I mean, that can be done just, uh, you know, that's not just a choice, but it needs to be implemented over years, I guess. Uh, so that something like this can can grow. Um, but do you think there are some low hanging fruits in terms of tooling uh, for provenance tracking, license analysis, and so on that the Nix community could add to simplify using it? 
Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I'm uh, seeing is that Nix is very, very useful for, uh, how would you say that, forward provenance. So if I have a recipe and all uh, the dependencies and all that, then I can build it and then I get a deliverable installed under a certain hash. But the um, other way around, like, okay, well, I actually have a hash of a package and then can I find out how it actually was built? Because uh, that, that is something that I think is missing because things like build scripts, they are sometimes deleted or the, they, the software just disappears. So, so something like it, it, if you build a package successfully and that you could then somehow put the a closure of the build scripts or a minimal, minimal closure of the build scripts so, and then the patches and then the recipe and so on into some sort of registry so we can do then do a reverse lookup for like, okay, I have a hash. Please tell me how it was built. I think that could be useful. So that that is that is some some low hanging fruit. Um, also, one of the things that that is a bit of a pet peeve is that the licensing information in mixed packages could probably use a little bit of a boost because that's uh, <laughs> well that that's what uh, every distribution suffers from. But probably there is some uh, some stuff that can be improved there as well. And of course, Python bindings. I keep telling Elka, I can make Python bindings to next book. So far, he has been uh, resistant. Perhaps there's enough people bothering about it. Um. Yeah, so, so everyone, please bother Elko to write Python bindings. <laughs> um, no, uh, I do not have any other questions. Uh, do you, Matthias? I'm good as well. Okay. So. Then uh, I would like to thank you, Armin, for this amazing presentation and the amazing insights that you gave into the history of Nixfez as well. All right, my pleasure. So I am back. Um, I would again like to quickly thank Armin for the amazing talk, and I really hope you guys enjoyed the talk as well. I'm going to. If you have questions, more questions for Romain, because Romain is actually in the, the Matrix chat, um, please head over to the Matrix chat and ask your questions over there. Um, I also want, quickly want to thank Matthias for forwarding some questions from Oncas and YouTube over to uh, the Matrix. So thank you, Matthias. And I will also, I have a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, last time I didn't tell you guys what the next lecture would be, but this time I, I know what the next lecture will be and I'm gonna drop it. Uh, the next lecture will be given by, given, sorry, by John Ringer. And his lecture will be about the history and structure of Nix packages or architecture rather. Uh, I do hope to see you all there. I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk by Armain as well. I know I did. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching.